supported by Verso Studios, created locally and shared with the world. Good evening, everybody. How are you doing tonight? Great. OK, yes, I am standing on my tippy toes because Michelle Nishan is a lot taller than I am. But that's OK. I'm Jennifer Keller, for those of you who don't know me. And it's my honor to welcome you this evening to the Dinner Disrupted Partnership of Libraries event. The goal of these events is to shed light on issues around food insecurity, climate change, land use, and agriculture and hopefully create change in our own current close local food system. Tonight, I'd like to thank Sustainable Westport and the Farmer's Market for their support in this program. And I'm going to introduce tonight's, no, that's not what I was gonna say. To introduce tonight's speaker is the current director of Westport's own Farmer's Market, Lori Cochran, who, as you know, embraces change to better our environment and food systems for this town and all of them around Westport. Lori, come on up. All right, let's see how I can do this. Um, all right, tell me if you can hear me. Sorry, Michelle, no, I'm not supposed to touch that. All right, so I've never done this. I, I love to speak into a microphone, and but I'm a, a little nervous about messing up anything that has to do with this man. So I, I'm truly honored to get to introduce a friend of mine and actually a mentor. So to tell you a little bit about Michelle, he has been in the food and sustainability industry for 35 years. He is a four-time James Beard award-winning chef. That is no small feat, that is a huge feat. He is the co-founder of the Chef Boot Camp for food, po I'm sorry, the, what, let's see if I get this one right. <laughs> I'll get tongue-tied up here. He is the co-founder for the Chef's Boot Camp at the, gym. let's see if I get this right, hang on. I got it right, I've been practicing this all day. There are a lot of co-founders and founders in this thing, so I gotta get them all right. He is the co-founder of the Chef Boot Camp for Policy and Change at the James Beard Foundation. Yes. He and the late Paul Newman founded and partnered in the dressing room restaurant that was infamous here in Westport. Yay, that's another one. He is a three-time three cookbook author that all have delicious, sustainable food recipes. They are gorgeous cookbooks. If you do not have one, I recommend getting one today. He is a devoted, and I think this to me is one of the top things. He is a devoted husband, father, grandfather, and friend. He is endlessly available for those in need. He is the founder and president of Wholesome Crave. Wholesome Crave is a sustainably sourced food company that is focused on large scale organizations. But a little bit of a good note on Wholesome Crave is someone who has purchased from them and loves their product, you can now buy from them. You can buy directly from them actually. And if you needed a better incentive than it tasting delicious, a percentage of the proceeds go to Wholesome Wave. Now, Wholesome Wave is a nonprofit food equity organization that Michelle co founded and is the current, I'm sorry, yeah, he co founded and is the current executive chairman. So I have to take a step back. Nonprofit food equity organization. That is the biggest simplification of Wholesome Wave. When I read that description, I was like, hang on, this group is dynamic. They are innovative, they're game changers, they're policy makers. They have their boots on the ground, whether it's in Bridgeport to DC. So Mich Michelle is gonna tell us a little bit more about what they're doing, but wow, I mean, it's just, it's an amazing organization. And of late, so, well, wait a second. How many of you all remember that this event was supposed to happen in September? Ooh, okay, well, if that gentleman didn't have the best darn reason to reschedule, I don't know who has. 
So he was invited to be the speaker at the White House Conference for Hunger, Nutrition, and Health. The second ever. The last one was in 1969. So I'm saying this because this is a plug for him to tell us a little bit why. Not only was he asked to be the speaker, but he was then asked to be on the advisory council. The thing I'd like to say about Michelle is every time I talk to him, I actually avoided him a little bit tonight when I got here just because it, I didn't want to get choked up when I said this, but every time I talk to him, it is not an I or a me. It is a we and an us. Yeah, I agree. And lastly, but not least, he and the late, great Paul Newman were the co-founders of an organization that I love dearly, the Westport Farmers Market. So I don't think I forgot anything. If I did, I sincerely apologize. But now we're going to watch a video, and then I would like to introduce my great friend, Michelle Nishan. I remember one time, uh, Michelle and I had the great honor to cook for Dalai Lama. And everybody was nervous how to speak to Dalai Lama, where she would sit, except Michelle. Uh, he just walked straight up, moved everybody aside, and gave him a big hug. When you meet him, you see right away that he's generally very happy and excited. It translates into his food, it translates into his cause, and that's very inspirational to me. When I think of Michelle, I think of someone who's really just full of life. Big smile on his face, thoughtful, passionate. He gets things done, and it doesn't matter whether he's cooking, trying to help farmers, trying to feed hungry people. It's always the same level of commitment from him. Food can fix anything, therefore food is change. I really believe it. Not just because I'm a chef. <laughs> My farm roots are deep. Both my mom and dad were farmers. Food was this magical, wonderful, special thing. I was 19 years old. I got a job at a place called Center's Truck Stop. As a breakfast cook, delivery trucks would come up and deliver stuff. Tomatoes that were like perfectly round and pink. No flavor. It's about that time that I said, I'm going to become a chef. And when I become a chef, I'm going to be the best chef because I'm just going to buy from farmers and I'm going to solve this frickin' tomato thing, you know? That's how I became a chef. By 1982, I was the chef at the Fleur de Lis. Michel is a pioneer. Questions that everyone's asking now, he was asking it decades ago. I know there was tables and I know there were farms before Michel Lachan, but way before there was a movement called Farm to Table, he was thinking about that. He was cooking that food. In 1991, our firstborn son, Chris, was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. That was a real significant emotional event for us. It can be prevented through food. In the early stages, it can be reversed through food. Yes, you have your medical insulin, but equal to that is every ounce of nutrition you can get out of your fresh fruits and vegetables. I really felt like I needed to be able to do something. He was willing to put himself out there and start talking about policy, because immediately then you're talking about politics. And he wasn't afraid of going there. Partnership for a Healthier America, Building a Healthier Future, TED Med, TEDx. When I actually met Michelle with Michael Batterbury, we started helping immigrant farmers access New York restaurants. He was able to raise foundation money, and then we looked at what could be done in Washington to add to that. So it was that interchange with Gus that eventually led to founding Wholesome Wave. Wholesome Wave is all about seeing that everybody, regardless of income, has access to locally grown, affordable, fresh food. For our marquee program, we raise private money to double the value of food stamps when spent at farmer's markets. The work that Michelle's doing at Wholesome Wave, especially what he, what he managed to do around the double value coupon, that takes a special person. And just the fact that he managed to get $100 million for this program in the Farm Bill, most people don't even know what it is, let alone knowing how to, how to navigate it. It just you know, it speaks volumes about who Michelle is as a person. If everybody got a chance to had access to the best that our farmers could provide, that's real opportunity. And he had a vision for what people could be if given that chance. I think that makes him a real humanitarian in the, in the truest sense of the word. Food will equal change. Food will prove itself as the thing that can fix everything.
Wow. Hi, hi everybody. Thanks for coming. It's hard to watch stuff like that. Um, <laughs> it's just really hard. Um, I'm going to set a timer because my mom would have told you, uh, if you ask Michelle what time it is, he'll tell you how a clock is built. I'm going to see if this works, right? Okay, so tonight, first of all, thank you, Lori, for that amazing um, introduction. I, I love you. I love everything that you've done with the farmer's market. You've made it so much more than so many of us ever dreamed that it could become. And it's made the entire community a better place. So thank you for that. Jennifer and the team here at, at the Westport Library. I mean, what an amazing place. I just, I can't, can't believe um, you know, what, everything that the library has become. So thank you for inviting me here. And uh, thanks to the folks at James Beard for, for that video. Um, I do have um, some updates. Um, the gentleman with the tie in the suit, Gus, uh, Gus Schumacher, the late Gus Schumacher, was a former undersecretary of agriculture for the USDA. He and I co-founded Wholesome Wave Together, that program that we created crazy idea to raise private money to double food stamps when spent on fruits and vegetables at farmers markets. Um, Tom Colicchio mentioned that it was funded at $100 million as a pilot in the Farm Bill. In two th that was in 2015, this video. In 2018, uh, it was made permanent, fully funded at $250 million and named after Gus Schubach. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, he was an awesome human being. Anyway, really good stuff, more to come. But tonight we're talking about the power of food. The question we ask is for better or for worse, either can happen when you talk about food. And the good news, the best news is that we decide. Uh, so that's what, that's a conversation I'd like to have. You know, now my mom, I like to talk about her a lot. She was a spectacular human being, an amazing chef in her own right, even though she only had a fifth grade education from Morley, Missouri. Uh, but she taught me how to connect with people through food, how to nourish, how to nurture, how to love people through food, how to raise an animal with care, take its life with as much humaneness as you could, turn it into something delicious, and then tell the type of story that could help others really appreciate it, what, what it was. She really understood genuine hospitality to the core. And it was those early learnings that really led to a pretty amazing life for me, my wife Lori, who's here tonight, my daughter Courtney, our entire family. You know, I, I remember when I got started in all of this madness um, back in, in 1979, I was at, at this truck stop that they mentioned, that I mentioned in the video, and I, I quickly got invited to work in other restaurants because I had these skills, but I would get in the restaurants, they're busy places, people forgot I was introduced, I, they were told I knew how to cook, but then when they would ask me to get stuff, I didn't know what they called things in restaurants. So, for instance, an 1180A, 1180-A strip loin is the thing that New York strip steaks get cut out of. Well, if you're a farmer, it's a back strap. So when somebody would say, oh, here's that guy who's supposed to know how to cook. Go get me an 1180A strip. And I'd be like, what? They're like, okay, peel potatoes. So <laughs> for, for a few weeks, I was peeling potatoes um, in these restaurants and slicing onions, doing very well. They're like, wow, the guy can prep. Um, but they, they were in the weeds one night, and there was a leg of veal sitting on the table that the chef could not get to. And people were like cutting little pieces off of it and trying to pound it out for this roulatini thing uh, for this event that we had going on. And I'm like, I can do that. I picked up a knife, started seaming out the leg of veal, and they're like, holy cow, he's a butcher, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and I'm like, uh, no, I'm not. I'm just, you know, I, but I know what I'm doing. And they're like, give me the eye of the round. And I said, what's that? And they said, well, it's like this long. It's shaped like, I'm like, oh, boom, pulled it out. And I handed it to them. And then they were like, he just doesn't know how, what to call things, you know. So it was, um, that's when I decided to buy this book called La Technique from Jacques Pepin, right? Um, and then all of a sudden the European chefs at the time um, started offering me $2 raises to be lead line cook and other stuff. And it was really two events that kind of um, led to my early trajectory for success. And that was getting yelled at from my Alsatian chef for turning away a delivery of tomatoes because I really thought they looked like crap, because they did. <laughs> and he's like, you just turned away our tomatoes. What are we going to do tonight for dinner? So to make up for him, I went home and I got a beer flat full of tomatoes from my mother's garden and gave it to him. 
he looked at the tomatoes, tried the tomatoes, and then he started treating me very differently. So that was the same chef who I could actually butcher the leg of veal faster than he could. So he came to me one day and said, I want you to be my sous chef. And I said, what's that? <laughs> and he said, it's $5 more an hour. I'm like, awesome, I'm a sous chef. Um, but anyway, um, from you know breakfast truck stop to a French restaurant in 1981, in three years I went from a truck stop cook to a, to a chef at a French restaurant to where I am today, all started on the farm. All started with the fact that I held food in very high regard, and that's gonna be part of our conversation tonight. Now, my youth and early career was really about my awakening to the fact that the way that my grandfather, and some, some of these photos, I think, are of our garden. We grow our own organic food as well. But, you know, that way of farming and the way that we were taught to revere food the way we revered food and how we served each other and, and the whole process and the ceremony and all of that stuff was actually kind of gone the way of the albatross. That was, that was kind of my awakening. And I, I just looked at that and I thought, you know, this, something, something just ain't right here. You know, this is, this is really where we're at. This is how most of the food in the world is actually produced. I was really completely unaware of this reality until I became a decision maker, you know, a, a, an executive sous chef and then a chef having to buy my own stuff um, and, and really learn the truth of the system. And, and, and that's the first time I drew the line in the sand. This is like 1982 and I'm like, this just can't be. Um, but there, there were all these truths that also perplexed me. It's like, once you're a chef, you're so curious, you're serving other people food, so you feel like you serve them something that you wouldn't feed your family, you can't sleep at night, so you do the research and all that jazz. And, and some of those truths were that 35% of all world trade is food. Over a third of the global economy is food. That's massive. So... I had to say, yeah, it would be great if we could, if everything could come from like my grandfather's farm, but then how do you feed these billions of people, right? You need these big systems. How do you reconcile that? But big systems cause big problems. 34% of all man-made greenhouse gases come from the food system and agriculture. That's huge. Top five diet-related diseases, diet-related diseases, things that you can actually prevent from eating the right kind of food cost us 1.2 to 1.4 trillion dollars a year to treat and in lost productivity. That's massive economic cost. Uh, and that's disproportionately borne by low-income communities, whether they're rural, Appalachia, Compton, uh, Native American, that's where most of these, um, the, the highest cost is, right? So all of this is because human society truly fails to hold food in the highest regard possible. To, to most people, honestly, to so many, food should be cheap, food should be easy, food should be something that you quickly take care of because you're hungry. You just want to get it out of the way. Uh, but to me, food as a single subject has more impact on human health, societal health, mental health, environmental health, community health, economic health than any other single subject. Energy. I mean, again, 34% of all greenhouse gases just from food. It's amazing. Single subject, right? Um, so, you know, it just, um, for me, I couldn't have been luckier when Lori and I, when Nell introduced us to Paul. You know, Nell, Nell and I have known each other for decades. We were the weird ones who were doing panels on organic food back like 30, 35 years ago, and there were like 20 people in the room. Now if we do a panel, there's a thousand people in the room. But you know, she, a lot of people don't know this, um, you know, about my relationship with Paul, but when, when the Newmans first approached me to do the restaurant, I said no. Uh, because I had left the restaurant business. I had a consulting company. I had restaurants that I was managing, managing contracts in India and other places, all based on larger scale sustainability plays. Um, but I did say, I, I'll give you free advice. I live 10 minutes away. Um, and then eventually, as, as happens with anybody who spends more than 10 minutes with the man, I fell in love with him. Um, but I do remember uh, one of our first meetings, the deal originally was, Paul, find an operator 
And I will make sure, because this is what Nell was worried about, he just, she, I, I just want to make sure that they're not telling my father they can't do enough local, they can't do enough organic, because it'll tank the business. You know the truth, you've made it happen, you've been successful at it, be an advisor. So we met with the first restaurateur who I knew and knew me, and it was in that meeting that actually um, the Westport Farmer's Market was born. Felton Weller looked at me and said, Michelle, you're the guy who drives up to New Milford, Connecticut and buys a pig in your minivan and brings it back to your restaurant and butchers it. You're the guy who goes to Fort Hill Farm and buys your vegetables and brings it back and pickles them. It's like, I can't do that. So I said, Paul, you've got Newman's Own Foundation. Would you guys consider providing some funding to have a farmer's market in the parking lot. You got 230 spaces. If we set up a farmer's market on Thursdays, we get our food delivered once a week. And he stood up and he hugged me and he said, I really like you. That's how the Westport Farmer's Market was born. Um, so he was like, let's do this. Let's do it here. Let's have this community gathering place. But um, you know, there could not be a better human being to be in business with, and many of you have known him personally, you guys have met him, you know that the way he is when you meet him face to face is the way everybody believes Newman would be, just a genuinely caring human being. So um, God bless him. Uh, anyway, one of the things I did share with Paul uh, was my frustration around this notion when I started doing Heartbeat Restaurant back in the mid 90s, this is pre-dressing room, when Chris was diagnosed with diabetes, I had this restaurant of well-being, no cream, no butter, no flour, no sugar, how do you make food delicious? <laughs> we figured it out, we got three stars in the New York Times and got zero stars in the New York Post, got accused of being the food police, you know. So we were controversial and busy, but it was in that environment that I started learning from folks like Walt Willett, because he asked me to join his advisory committee at Harvard School of Public Health, T.H. Chan School of Public Health, about the social determinants of health and how the majority of costs of diet-related diseases were borne by people with low income. I learned about the family of four who runs out of food stamps in the middle of the month and has $2 to spend for all, pe all four people on dinner. That's like nothing. That's 50 cents a person. Uh, there are many of us who, yeah, because we just don't know any better, just assume that pe the, the people with low income are, are buying a lot of fast food and, and stuff like that. And they're not buying any fast food. When they do buy fast food, it might be a happy meal so their kid can feel normal too. But that's not what they're having every day. Because if you use $2 for four people at McDonald's, if there's a dollar McChicken, everybody gets a half a chicken sandwich. That's not dinner. So it's often instant rice with cream of mushroom soup, instant noodles with condensed milk, whatever it might be. Very, very frustrating to me that in the greatest country in the world, and it, this actually happens all over the world, that there were people that couldn't afford to put decent food on the table for their family. And Paul was pretty frustrated about it too. So when I told him about mining Gus's idea to double food stamps for fruits and vegetables at farmer's markets, he said, that sounds like a good idea. What's stopping you from doing it? And I said, well, you know, it's illegal. He's like, awesome. Let's get some money and do this thing. Um, and that's when Wholesome Wave was founded. Uh, so we really founded Wholesome Wave on the power, not only just on the power of food, but the notion that f if food is really, really powerful, if we really want to unlock the power in a very, very dramatic and very impactful way, it's got to be something that's available to everybody all the time. So we did create Wholesome Wave with the thought that it's like, okay, this thing is illegal. We have Gus Schumacher. Um, who is a two-term undersecretary of agriculture who could help us navigate through all the policy uh, bumps and grinds in the way. So we went from doubling food stamps from being illegal to getting waivers that allowed us to do it in certain environments, farmers markets, and then eventually grew to grocery retail. Um, and now it's something that's permanently embedded in the farm bill. But our, our thought was, let's raise private money, show the government what would happen if the ta our tax dollars were spent different, better, 
and then just show lawmakers on both sides of the aisle that it's a good idea and maybe something will happen and sure enough it is and we're audacious enough to believe that we can make more policy happen as well um, but anyway here are the things that we've been able to achieve at wholesome wave uh, we really focused on farmers markets local farms local farmers because what a lot of people don't know about smallholder farmers is that um, you know two things one is that believe it or not in the scaled food system that I showed you before um, Actually, 33% of all food consumed in the world comes from smallholder farmers. One third of all food consumed by human beings on the face of this earth come from little guys. But those little guys, and Lori knows this very, very well, a lot of the farmers at the Westport Farmers Market rely on off-farm income if they want to pay their mortgage. Just the business of selling you stuff at that market does not pay their mortgage. So often the farmer is an engineer, a mechanic, an accountant, an attorney, a part-time attorney, whatever it might be. And often the husband, the wife, and the kids are working other jobs to bring money onto the farm so that they can continue to farm. Crazy stuff. But that's why we started with the farmer's markets. Our whole thing was raise private money, put it in the hands of people who can't afford good food, they eat good food, they pay the farmers full price so that the farmers can do more sales, everybody wins. Um, so anyway, um, th this is kind of like the, the environment um, that we really, really, really were targeting here. You know, the place where people can come together as a community and connect and learn. Go, I mean, every, almost everything you're seeing, except for this one picture here in Somalia, this one picture in Somalia, um, everything else here is happening in the United States. We have Somali growers. We have Botswana growers. We have Vietnamese growers. We have Cambodian growers. We have Chinese growers. We have Central American growers. We have, we, we have farmers from all over the world growing the food of their heritage in this new place that they call home. You can literally take a trip around the world in this country and never leave its shores because of this. And when we talk about the impact of all of it, you know, when we look at the folks that are standing here, 20% of our global workforce alone is agriculture. 27% global workforce, agriculture only. 33% of that the food that's being consumed by you know, uh, by the globe is, you know, 27% of the people who live here are actually producing that food. 31% um, of people on food stamps are food industry and service workers. That's a third of everybody who needs federal food assistance are the people that are actually feeding us, right? 86% of the smallholder farmers who are providing all of that food for the world, 86% live at or below the poverty level. So for all the horrible statistics and befuddling dynamics about the impacts of large-scale agriculture on our economy, the fact that small-scale production, small-scale smallholder farmers are producing a third of our stuff, you know, it just, it's perplexing. You know, when I look at, at how big these systems are, but that so much food is being really supplied to the world by people who have such limited resources, there's got to be something that we can do about it. That's why we focus on policy. Um, I also learned that kind of the philo th philanthropic system it has, has its own kind of befuddling dynamics. I found that running a nonprofit is like being in Series A Groundhog Day. How many people know what a Series A raise is? Anybody? Okay. All right, good. So here's how it goes. If you want to start a for-profit business, let's, let's, let's give it a name. Blue Apron. <laughs> okay. I've got this idea where I'm going to take really awesome food. I'm going to kind of pre-prepare it so it's not too pre-prepared so people do need some skills so they feel some ownership over the meal. And I'm going to deliver it to their house with the recipes and some videos and stuff. They're going to buy it. It's a great idea. So first I got to prove the concept. So I get an angel investor or a group of angel investors. I go out and I do that. And when it works, now I can go to other investors, and there are different investors for all these different stages. I just learned this because I did it with Wholesome Crave. But anyway, um, you know, so, so then you do your seed round. This is the money that you raise now to prove the concept, to take it to a broader marketplace. Once you prove the concept, then you go into a Series A, Series B, Series C. You raise this money, and then you become 
Blue Apron, which is like, you know, a half billion dollar company now. It's massive, it's big, but they don't have to raise money anymore, right? When you're in a nonprofit, every waking hour of every single day for you and the top talent of your organization is spent asking people for money. 70% of your time is asking people to support what you're trying to get done instead of being out in the field, innovating, coming up with ideas, et cetera, et cetera. So um, one thing that a lot of people don't know about the Newman's Own model is that until December of 2018, it was illegal. It was under a 10-year treasury waiver. When Paul first created Newman's Own, he used to basically say, I'm gonna have, I'm gonna have a bank account, me and Hotch, we don't need the money. Our families don't need the money. Let's give it all away. We're going to create a bank account. And all the money um, that we raise after we pay staff, pay bonuses, health insurance, you know, pay our suppliers, cost of goods, et cetera, what would fall, what they call it the EBITDA line, earnings before interests, tax, and depreciation, et cetera, right? You know, before it falls below the EBITDA line and we have to pay taxes on it, we're just going to write checks to charities that are doing awesome things and write it off on our taxes. The IRS hated it. <laughs> they audited him every year brutally, and it was expensive. So he hired a nonprofit consulting firm that came up with the idea of let's create a foundation, let's sell your intellectual property to the foundation, and let the foundation license the name to the C Corporation uh, intellectual property for a large enough gross revenue proceed that nothing falls below the EBITDA line, right? So that just became legal um, uh, in December, I think December 14th of 2018. Thank you, Richard Blumenthal, um, for getting that deal pushed through. But the minute that became legal, I created a company called Wholesome Crave. Now, similar to Newman's Own, we do the same thing. Wholesome Wave, the nonprofit, owns the IP to Wholesome Crave. Dissimilar to Newman's Own, we're not in grocery retail. We sell into scaled food service, so large, you know, feeders like um, Michigan State University, U University of Massachusetts, Amherst, uh, Google, Amazon, et cetera, right? And then gross revenue proceeds support the work of Wholesome Wave. So we create plant-based, culturally relevant soups for scaled food service industry. Large portion of gross revenue proceeds goes to Wholesome Wave, so we can eventually stop asking people for money. Still a bit early. Uh, we started like in the middle of 2019, perfect timing. Our buddy COVID came along. Nobody was buying food. Um, but now that we're out of it and we're in colleges and universities, the business is robust, and uh, we're seeing really great early signs of success, so wish us luck. Um, but, um, you know, one of the things that was important to me when we created Wholesome Crave, one was that we were plant-based. One of the things that was remarkable to me, I am not a vegan. Um, I eat a lot of fruits and vegetables. I love fruits and vegetables. I was vegan for a short period of time in my life. It was just too hard for me. Um, but, you know, I can't tell you how many people that I met over the 15 years of Wholesome Wave from underserved communities on the south side of Chicago to you know East Los Angeles uh, to Appalachia who would thank us for the work because they actually were vegan and could not afford all the stuff that they needed to get the nutrients they needed when they relied on federal food, food assistance. So, so uh, like Wholesome Wave, Wholesome Crave is all about fruits and vegetables. So all our soups are plant-based. We don't use fake protein. It's all whole grains, legumes, vegetables, and stuff like that. Uh, but that's the deal. But also, our company is based on, on the, the racial and the ethnic equity principles of fidelity, fidelity, equity, and dignity that we have at Wholesome Wave. So this is our impact board. These are all equity holders in the, in the company. They all hold a piece of equity. So we have Oaxacan-style soup. We have Indian-style soup. We have Mediterranean style soup. Soon we're going to have West African style soup. And, um, you know, the first eight soups were designed by the colonial white guy who's been lucky enough to work his way around the world. Uh, but as we move forward, new products, new concepts are going to be designed by these folks with me. And they're going to get additional equity and profit sharing. Uh, a lot of the universities that we're in right now want us to do culturally authentic concepts because their Gen Z students are demanding 
non-appropriation and stuff like that. So, you know, what, what I've learned in setting our company up this way is that it's differentiated us from all of our competition, not only in the fact that our, our soups are viably fully plant-based and delicious, because so many soup companies actually see plant-based as a pain in the neck, um, but they're also culturally authentic as well. And you might recognize some of those folks up there. Um, you know, Jacques, Jacques represents age and Claudia represents women, um, but <laughs> it's all good stuff. And Sean Sherman, by the way, the Lakota Sioux chefs, he's a Oglala Lakota Sioux, just wanted James Beard Award for a Wamni restaurant, uh, best new restaurant in America uh, on this last round of James Beard Award. So, so the, these folks are amazing, um, you know, and, and I believe that with the traction that we're seeing, our goal is within the next five to 10 years to really be able to make sure that Wholesome Wave is independent. The other thing about philanthropy is that a lot of foundations love to be able to give their dollars and say, what does my dollar get me? They, they like the food bank thing of, of a dollar provides 10 meals. I'm here to tell you a dollar doesn't provide 10 meals. Cisco and the grocery stores that donate food for free is what makes the 10 meals possible. The dollar pays to get the food to people. Um, but, you know, uh, a lot of foundations don't like to fund policy initiatives. They see it as lobbying. It's not lobbying because you're not asking them for money so that you can support somebody's political campaign to get a quid pro quo. Pro, quid pro quo. Um, we literally basically do these pilots, prove that they work, that there's a positive economic impact, that farmers put more land in production, that farmers markets make infrastructural investments, that grocery stores that didn't have produce refrigerators buy produce refrigerators, and that people struggling with poverty eat more fruits and vegetables. That's how we get the laws passed. There's no quid pro quo, but it's hard, hard to raise money for. Um, so when I did get invited, and I'm sorry that I, I had to cancel on you guys in September, um, but when we did get invited to participate in this White House conference and all of the functions that led up to it, um, one of the outcomes was the policy brief. This is the White House's policy strategy um, for the next several um, uh, administrations to come because this involves the Food and Drug Administration. It involves a number of agencies in the U.S. government. It's not about who's in control of Congress. It's about who's running these agencies. Um, we have a National Produce Prescription Collaborative that's a coalition of groups that we put together to do a similar thing with produce prescriptions. So imagine if you're a low-income family, um, you, you're, you're the head of household, you passed out at one of your part-time jobs because you didn't know it, but you're on your way to type 2 diabetes, you end up in the emergency room, the doctor comes out and says, um, I got some bad news and I got some good news. Bad news, you have a high hemoglobin A1C, you're overweight, you're hypertensive. Um, the good news is that if you eat better, eat more fruits and vegetables, eat more whole grains and legumes, you won't get type 2 diabetes. But if you don't do that, the next time you, I see you, you'll have it. And again, that had a household who has $2 to spend for four people on dinner halfway through the month when they run out of food stamps isn't going to change their food plan. So they end up with the type 2 diabetes, and then we pay for 100% of their medication, their organ transplants, their dialysis, their non-traumatic limb amputations, 70,000 of those a year for people with type 2 diabetes. Very, very, very expensive. So our next our next um, uh, concept was to get Medicare, Medicaid, Indian Health Services, and the Veterans Administration to pay for their low-income members, pay for the fruits and vegetables they need to avoid diabetes in the first place. All of our stuff, all that highlighted stuff, this is page 17. There are another four pages after this that are under pillar of two of the strategy. All of it made the strategy. Our work is in there. So um, we do, yeah, thank you. It is kind, it is kind of a big deal, um, you know, because I, what I would love to see is the day where we can hang out the clothes shingle on Wholesome Wave and just ride off into the sunset. Be, be the nonprofit that actually got it done, achieved the mission, and we're no longer needed because we as a society have come to a point where we now, every single one of us, 
hold food in its highest regard. Um, so we've been moving at the speed of change. We're getting stuff done. Um, you know, um, one, of the, one of the things that I would like to do and I often get is, you know, people do ask, what can we do? So, you know, for all that we've been able to accomplish at Wholesome Wave and Wholesome Crave, two humble little companies on very small budgets, but we, we get change done, I believe that that transfers into everybody's bottom line and the decisions that, that they make at home. Um, I'm going to tell you a quick story, and then I'm going to end it and, and take questions and answers. But I, I, I was at the 92nd Street Y back in 1998 after I opened Heartbeat Restaurant. Um, we had just gotten our big review. There was a lot of buzz, and it was uh, Marie Rodale, Eric Schlosser, and a person who will remain nameless. Um, um, we're on this panel about organic stuff, and the person who will remain nameless owned a, a certified organic cleaning, household cleaning chemical company. Uh, Eric Schlosser is the guy who wrote Fast Food Nation, an incredible book that exposed uh, the fast food business, its environment and, and human health impact. And uh, at the end of the panel, a woman got up and raised her hand in the Q&A session and said, I'm a single mother from Bedford Stuyvesant. I have two kids. You know, do I get organic milk? Do I get organic apples, grapes, chicken? What I can't afford to do. What can I do? And the per, the nameless person said, "You can't just do one thing. Every time you wash your children's hair, you're poisoning them." Every time you wash your dishes and serve your children food, you're poisoning them. And I could feel this woman shrink. I could literally feel this woman shrink. And she, it was the last question. Everything closed down. And I'm like, I can't let this end this way. And I followed her. The elevators weren't working. Everybody had to go down the stairs. Um, so I fought my way through to get to her. And I stopped her on a landing. And her mascara was running because she was crying. And I'm like, I'm a chef. I can help. And she's like, how, how are you going to help me? And I said, well, you know, I believe in organic food. I, I've got five kids. You know, it's like, what what to actually at the time I had four kids. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> it, it, it changes all the time. I, I can't remember any of their birthdays. Anyway, um, so, so I'm like, what do they like the most? And she said, they really like apples. They really like milk. And I'm like, pick apples. She said, what the, the, the mean person said. I'm like, forget the mean person. Imagine if tomorrow just 40% of everybody in the country chose organic apples. Not everybody, just 40%. Only apples. The North American apple industry would change forever. It's okay for people to do one thing. You know, so when I look at it, it's like we have the Westport Country. The, it's no longer at the Country Playhouse. I'm sorry. It's at the Women's Center at Imperial Avenue. But we, we have the Westport Farmers Market. It's like a lot of us buy there, you know, every week. We buy some of our food there, but we buy most of our food at like Costco or Whole Foods or Stop and Shop or whatever. It's like we're, we're of that place where we can make the decision to buy as much as we can from the farmer's market and look at the Costco's and the Whole Foods of the world as supplemental. It's difficult. Farmer's market doesn't always have dairy, doesn't always have meat. But there are meat aggregators. There are dairy collaboratives and cooperatives. Lori knows who they are. And if she doesn't know who they are, her farmers know who they are. Yeah, it's more work. But just like I used to take seed catalogs in 1981 to farmers in Economawak who were growing corn and soy to ask them to plant tomatoes for me, keep them watered, keep them weeded. I'd come and pick them myself so my customer could have ripe tomatoes. That was a lot of effing work, man. We can do this. We can do this. And the more we do that, because it's not just, you know, us being willing to pay more and work harder to get really good food on the table because we can afford to do it. It's like, all of those middle people in the system that are the reason why the smallholder farmers are getting 11 cents of every food dollar, the other 89 cents is going to the grocery retailers, the distributors, the brokers, the exporters, the importers. It's all 
stuff that's getting extracted out of the middle. Uh, Pierre Tiam, who's on our impact board, we just did a deal. He brings Fonio from women, women-owned smallholder collaboratives in West Africa between him and Google <laughs> to buy their stuff from them. Yeah, they have to pay for the transportation. They're paying the import, the export fees, and the taxes and stuff like that. But they're missing the 11 middle people in the middle that would cause those women to get 11 cents of the food dollar, and they're going to get 45 cents of the food dollar. Their chance of coming out of poverty is huge because of that. All those things can be driven by the decisions that you guys make. And I'm a neighbor. I'm a community member. I'm always here to help. I'm, you know, happy to connect you to anyone. Lori, anybody who's ever dealt with Lori knows that she can connect you to just about anybody you need to know if it has to do with making the world a better place through food, which is something that I believe we all should endeavor to do. Thank you for your time. And questions. Wait. Thank you so And I'd like to thank my daughter Courtney for designing the slideshow. It's awesome. Thank you so much, Michelle. You're welcome. For those of you in the building, if you have questions for Mr. Nishan, if you could come to this microphone so that everybody watching from home can hear you and um, we can hear you in the building. And they can be cooking questions too. How to, how to boil water. <laughs> I've, I've got an app for that. <laughs> all right. Hi. Nice question. I got all the pressure. Um, how do you think that the development of synthetic meat... Closer to the mic. Yeah. Oh, how do you think that the development of uh, synthetic and cultured meats will affect uh, global hunger? You know, I, that, uh, did everybody hear the question? Yep, okay, cool, good. Great, great job on the sound system, guys. Um, I'm not sure. I, you know, until... You know, I, I, I haven't decided where I land on it, uh, to be honest. One, one, of the, one of the things that there's no question at all, the current way that we raise animals is just freaking untenable. Um, the amount of meat that we eat is untenable. We just shouldn't be eating as much. We should be eating, like, less and paying more for pasture-based, pasture-finished. Um, if, if we could just get everybody to decrease their meat consumption by 50%, probably two-thirds of global CAFOs would close. Um, but I think um, the meat analog, the you're talking about the lab-generated meat, right, that, that uses uh, myoglobin and... Yep. Yep. Um, you know, it, it's as nutritive. Uh, it tastes exactly the same, unlike a lot of the plant-based meat analogs. Uh, it's wildly expensive to produce. So um, the question becomes... Um, you know, what, what, are, what are the parts um, of that, of whatever system it would take to make that affordable <laughs> at what cost? So I, I, don't, I don't know. I, if it could be done inexpensively, yeah. I, I think it's, it's, it's something that people should consider. Before I get off, yeah, I'll suggest you just take a look at it because it's becoming rapidly more affordable. Yeah, okay, cool, thanks. Awesome. Well, let's chat afterwards. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm sorry to make you to repeat this, but you explained what happened legislatively in 2018 that changed how a 501c3 can, can uh, work in the way you described. Would you mind giving me a little elaboration on that again? Yeah, absolutely. So um, the Newman's own model, which, um, which allowed Paul's intellectual property to live in the foundation so the foundation could license it, to the food company, which is basically a talent play. So if you think of um, Air Jordan, for instance, uh, Michael Jordan didn't get together with Nike and co-design a shoe, and he was an equity owner in the company of Nike. He let them use his name and likeness, approved the shoe, liked the shoe, and licensed his name for gross revenue. So he got, he got his cut off the top. So... Once Newman's Own owned that intellectual property, they could license it to the food company. That was not legal because the only legislation that kind of lived limited the amount of ownership that any foundation could have in any one company. 
And the ownership of the IP isn't the ownership of the company. <laughs> it's the ownership of the IP that you're actually licensing for a value. There's no precedent for that. So they needed a treasury waiver to be able to prove the model until either something passed in Congress or there was a rule or a regulation change that allowed it to happen. So you're really talking about the licensing of the branding or the, or the formula? Yes. Okay. Yeah, it's exactly what it is. But because it was a foundation, and because there were there were a lot of firewall, rightly, because when you look at, I, I won't name them by names, but some of the most famous foundations from the barons of industry uh, were actually being used to not have to pay taxes. And um, it, it was almost like a trust-busting move to go in and regulate these foundations so that there were real firewalls, separate independent boards of directors, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, only so much ownership and shares, et cetera. So they wanted to sh be able to demonstrate that and create environments where there wasn't self-dealing. Paul was just giving it all away. But, but but these were 501c3s that were nonprofits already, so they uh, made uh, excess funds that they used then or distributed, and that was illegal at that time? No, 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 so no, uh, the foundation has nothing to do with the food company. So the foundation doesn't make, sell the food. The food company is a C corp. So they do all the deals, they do the co-packing deals, they do, that's, that's when you get another manufacturer to manufacture something, or you find somebody who makes like a really kick-ass tomato sauce like Rayo's or something like that before their Rayo's and you say, hey, would you like to be part of the Newman's own brand? Someone else is manufacturing the product. You're licensing the name and that's how you get the money. And then the, the licensing fee is untaxed because it's going to a 501c3 private foundation. It's complicated. <laughs> it's, but it, it might explain why only two companies in the world do it right now, Whole, uh, Newman's Own and Wholesome Wave. A couple of wholly owned subsidiaries are doing it, but it's, it's a new model. Yes, hi. Hi, Marisol Castro, first time, long time. Um, thank you for doing this. Thank you. I am a journalist by trade. Um, I love the culinary industry. Oh. And I used to work uh, at Connecticut Public for a show called Seasoned. And when we were beginning the program, I made it my mission to try to find farmers who were of color, um, mm. specifically Latino farmers, black farmers, native farmers. And as I dug into the research, I was appalled um, mm. that there were so few. Yeah. Um, because we're, we're borrowing this land from our mm. ancestors. And I feel like you've dedicated your life to eating food from the earth. And I wonder if you could speak to what incentives there are or what we need to do as micro societies and big societies to mm -hmm. bolster the presence of farmers um, who come from underrepresented mm. uh, communities. Yeah, so there, there are a number of initiatives throughout the country right now. Heifer International has one called um, the New Immigrant Farming Initiative. Uh, that supports over 118,000 immigrant and refugee farmers throughout the country of wild diversity from Hmong Cambodians to Somali to Native American. Uh, but it, it's, I, I think total funding for the program is around $40 million a year, which is like nothing. nothing. If anyone's ever been in the agricultural business, it's kind of like, it, like wine, restaurants, and farming. If you want to make a small fortune, you start with a large one, right? Yeah, it's really expensive to do, but when you're of color, one of the biggest issues is not being able to have equitable access to credit not being able to have equitable access to land ownership. You get denied every time. Um, one of the good news is out of this same policy conference where we were able to embed uh, our produce prescription program in, into, um, into the strategy, there are already a number of grant programs. One of the things that we actually won at was with Shelley Pingree from Maine because she runs the committee that, that it oversees Indian Health Services, uh, a $3 million pilot for Navajo Nation to do produce prescriptions for Navajo-grown foods and indigenous foods. And there's, uh, Tom Vilsack announced, I think it was like a month and a half or two months ago, you know, like a $80 million package a year to start specifically funding uh, indigenous farmers here in the United States. 
there's only so much government can do under pilot programs. What I love that Sean Sherman is doing, he's one of our impact board members. Again, we, we have the impact board members so that we can create recipes that are really culturally authentic. But I chose Pierre because he created the Phonio project. Um, you know, with West African women-owned collaboratives. Sean has created a pro program now, multiple programs with hand-harvested wild rice from South Central Canada and North Central um, uh, United States, which includes Minnesota, Michigan, et cetera. All of these products are coming to market. You gotta look for them. You find them online. The rice is like six times as expensive as Uncle Ben's. 37,000 times more delicious, but when you look at the price your pound, per pound you're paying to put rice on the plate, dinner costs you like five bucks, um, it's worth it. Those products are out there, tepary beans, uh, Hopi blue corn, all of these products are starting to come to market through these social enterprises. What I would love to see is some of the new market's tax credit money from the treasury mm -hmm. <laughs> that now is going to grocery store owners to build a grocery store in a low-income community and offer jobs to actually go and build out the infrastructure that allows these indigenous and BIPOC um, smallholder farmers to flourish. Because all they need is a little bit of capital to modernize their infrastructure, and they could do amazing things. Plenty of buyers out there in the college, university, corporate space that want these products, but they just can't get them to market because they're driving broken tractors. Some of, the, some of them are still using oxen to plant uh, Iroquois white corn in the Seneca Nation. I don't know if I answered your question. You did, but. you did. We <laughs> both have a lot of work to do. Yeah, well, we, we all have a lot of work to do, but uh, you know, the, I, I think the great thing for everybody in the room is we have the power, we all know how to use the, well, I don't know how to use it really well, my daughter helps me all the time, but you know, get online and do the research, buy, buy directly from these producers. Hi, um, thank you so much for being here. My name's Haley. If you do go to the Westport Farmers Market, you probably recognize me from there. And I also work with an organization, Food Rescue US, which was headquartered in Fairfield County. Nice. I am so excited to hear everything that you mentioned. I fully, with my whole body, support everything mm. that you are about and your organization is about. I would love to hear from you some key takeaways that um, you pulled or things got you energized and excited from the White House Conference on Hunger, Health, and Nutrition. Um, the, thank you. Um, I think the thing that energized me the most is that the, the strategy, um, almost everything in that strategy, let me see if I can go back to it. So that thing has like a hundred and some odd pages. Um, all of them work within existing, uh, not all of them, most of them work within existing authority um, and can easily be managed by the agencies, all of the various agencies that are out there, the US Department of Agriculture, Economic Research Service, um, you know, NIFA, all of the different agencies of the USDA, Food and Drug Administration, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, Centers for Disease Control, et cetera. Uh, it actually gives the permission and lays the groundwork to actually move on these things without requiring an act of Congress and what we all know to be a very dysfunctional Congress right now. So the key takeaway was the architecture, the architecture. It, the first conference on food, hunger, and nutrition since 1969, which is where the Women, Infants, and Children Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program came that, that lifted millions of low-income young families out of poverty and put milk on the table uh, because under food stamps they couldn't afford the milk, that kind of a thing. All those came out of the 1969 conference, but a lot of that was active Congress work. Um, what I applaud um, the administration, the consultants, and you know, actually some of the groundwork was laid for this during the Bush administration. It's like work under existing authority, try not to require an act of Congress, and stuff can get done. So this work and these policy strategies are now marching orders for agencies that are filled with full-time what we call lifers, people who have said, I want my life to be devoted to the public service of you, my neighbor. I want to work in this agency because I'm American and I believe that I can make America a better place by serving my country this way. Um, so they're there no matter what happens in Congress. They don't change with the administrations. Their boss 
like 52, because the government is overstructured, you know, 52 lines on the organization chart up, they change with the administration, but the people doing the work that are under the guidance that's been issued don't change. So that to me is the key takeaway. Change will happen as a result of the conference. Thank you so much. I've asked, I, I've done a lot of research. Nobody has said that. I have not heard that answer anywhere else. So thank you so much. Oh, uh, you're welcome. My pleasure. Oh, hi, I know you. <laughs> hi. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, my daughter, Courtney. Hi, Courtney everybody. and Sean. Hi. <laughs> so I have a question just because um, working alongside him is so inspiring and I see so much and learn so much every day that I had no idea existed. It's kind of like, we, we learn as we go. I wrote it down because I get nervous. I don't do this, he does. So, oh, see. So, to give a little bit of hope or a little idea of how the world is changing with these new generations of a more diversified species and knowledge base, can you touch on what you're seeing now with what you do in colleges and what essentially that could mean if, we were to, if that was to fully scale for BIPOC and indigenous farmers and what are these students, what are we seeing in like, what, what does the new generation want essentially out of food? Because I feel wow. like what I've seen <laughs> with you is that there's a lot more demand for this than the old conventional farming subsidized stuff. Thank you question? for that question. You could have asked me any time. Well, I wanted to do it <laughs> right now because tonight, I feel like you know? You know, people would want to know about it. Anyway, um, uh, it's, it's actually astonishing. Thank you. Thank you for asking that question, honey. It's a good one. Um, so we... You know, our, our pivot in COVID because, you know, our business plan was supposed to go, we were going to start in corporate food service because I had a lot of connections there. And eventually, you know, a few years down the road, maybe go into college and universities. There are different parts of the supply chain, believe it or not. Um, when Google and Bank of America and Citigroup and all those guys shut down and we had nobody to sell soup to and colleges said, we're coming back in September 2020, we're like, you want some soup? And we kind of went there. Um, and it's been, a, it's been really wildly awakening. You know, college students are like farmer's market customers. They want to freaking know everything. And, it, and not only it's like everything, it's like, okay, can you prove how much the people are getting paid that made that? <laughs> they want to know that. They want that granular of information. Because of the speed at which information travels, this advent of this thing called the internet, I mean, I still see email as a new thing, you know, still trying to learn how to use it properly. Um, but it's, they, they want everything. And so many of them come from different areas of the country, different areas of the world. International students right now, some of the top populations are Malaysian, um, West African, South Indian, South Asian, Southeast Asian. Um, and one thing that a lot of people don't know, food insecurity that I've been describing, doubling SNAP, food stamps for pe people so they can get fruits and vegetables, produce prescriptions. Food insecurity in America is at about 26%. Food insecurity on college campuses is at 36%. So there, and uh, most of the people that are food insecure on college universities are from Compton, the west side of Chicago, Appalachia. They pulled themselves up by their bootstraps. They did really well in school. Straight A pluses, high grade point average, got the scholarship, got to college, and their parents don't have an income that can get them on the food plan. And you can't work any more than 25 hours or you get expelled <laughs> because you're in school to study and learn. So a lot of college students who come from families that have been able to get them to school or can back their college loans, whatever it might be, know that this is happening and they're freaking angry about it because these are their friends. You know, um, so what, what's been interesting is that student unions all around the country uh, have been banding together. Their, they call this the real food challenge, but they basically are holding their parents' feet to the fire, the people who are paying the bills, you know, um, and holding the college administration together saying, you guys are spending hundreds of millions of dollars a year 
on food that's coming from a supply chain that's exploitive, that isn't taking care of people, none of it's local or some of it's local, how much are people getting paid, is it culturally appropriate for our international students or people from the United States that come from different backgrounds, why is it cheeseburgers and, you know, you know that kind of a thing. They're, they care about all of it. You know, they, they want to know that the money that their parents are investing in their education aren't supporting a system that they feel they're perpetuating. So they, they really have become quite a force. And as a result, Culinary Institute of America and Harvard Business School and T.H. Chan School of Public Health did a partnership called Menus of Change that gets universities to pledge by measurable number uh, by this year, 20% of everything we buy is gonna come from local agricultural producers, 30% of our menus will be plant-based, et cetera. So they care about the environment, they care about climate change, they care about um, regenerative agriculture, they care about equitable supply chains, they care about all this stuff. I, I go to some of these symposiums where we go and we're like, we're, we're cooking food and they're, we're like, they're, they're like, oh, you're that guy. Uh, do, do you have a few minutes? And it turns into like four and a half hours of a really intense conversation. That's what's on their mind. And, and what I, I find is it, tremendously hopeful to me because these are our future consumers. And I, I've met a couple of these college kids who are like, I have one pair of jeans, but they're made with organic cotton. <laughs> I only have, I'm like, what else do you wear? They're like, yeah, I have a pair of Columbia sweatpants from my brother. <laughs> it's like, you know, but you know, when they can, they go to the farmer's market on campus, they're making very informed decisions about what they buy. They're doing with less in other parts of their lives. So I think they're getting off started on their future life, um, asking the right questions and really, really connecting the fact that their decision has more to do with what they're gonna put in their mouth today. Thank you. Sorry to take so long to answer the question. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Hi, Alexis Sosa. Thank you for sharing your experiences. They've been very inspirational and motivating. Thank you. Um, so I'm also with Food Rescue. We're a nonprofit here in Fairfield County, and we're in the food rescue space. Um, I'm new to this position, and I've recently learned that working with restaurants is a bit of a challenge. <laughs> so um, if you could just give your recommendations on how you think restaurants can have more of an, a larger role in addressing food security and especially nutrition security. So how can they have a larger presence in this space? Well, first, I, I'd love to invite you and anybody from Food Rescue. You can talk to me anytime as a former, as a reformed restaurateur. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and and I, I, because I, I, I would have a series of questions for you regarding where you, you feel you're running into challenges and maybe not getting some of the support that you would like to see or the engagement, whatever it might be. But I think... You know, when, when I look at restaurants as a whole, because we've always done this, um, you know, the, the, the chef's boot camps for policy and change in the chef's action network that we created with the James Beard Foundation about a decade ago actually works with chefs who are interested in working beyond the four walls of their kitchen, knowing that they actually have the ability. And for, first, you have to have the desire because it is a rough effing business. It's really, really, really tough. And the margins are very, very slim. Um, so it's one of the reasons why you have difficulty, um, you know, dealing in that space. But there, there's always leftover food. Uh, there, there are always ways to get something into the system by making some type of a change and what you're doing within the four walls of those kitchens. Mm -hmm. It's like, where does the leftover food go? Is it leftover food where you can pre kind of pre-forecast and have a mind to it so that you're setting it aside before it goes into the dining room because the health department doesn't want it to go to somebody else if it's already gone to the dining room and come back to the kitchen. There are all kinds of weird regulations that have never food poisoned anybody. Mm -hmm. It's like, show me the case, but sometimes we regulate our way out, uh, away from good intent, simple solutions that can actually put a good meal in front of somebody. But the, that's what these operators have to deal with. Um, so there's some pain points there. Uh, and and what, what I will offer to you is I'd love to have a conversation with you guys because what, 
what you could probably do is go to some of these restaurants with some very specific asks mm -hmm. that are things that I believe I know any restaurant in general could probably provide unless they're absolutely expert at wasting nothing. Mm -hmm. I've yet to meet that restaurateur, including myself. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just impossible when you have 250 people on a Saturday night ordering 35 different things at different times of the night. Yeah, anyway, uh, I'd, I'd be happy to help you. Um, I, I, it's not a lack of desire, I can tell you that. Right. Um, it's These are very wildly busy people who mm -hmm. just came out of a pan pandemic that shuttered 20% of the lifelong businesses of close personal friends of mine. So it's, it's a tough place to go. Um, but if there's one thing that I do know about chefs and restaurants is regardless of everything that they've just gone through with COVID and then the great resignation, they're, they're willing to help mm -hmm. if, if it doesn't mean that they have to drive themselves crazy figuring out a way to help because they're they're having trouble right now rubbing a couple of pennies and some paper clips together to get the bills paid. Absolutely. Thank yeah. you. And I look forward to that conversation. Yeah, please do. Don't hesitate. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, evening. My name is Reggie. Um, hey, Reggie. I'm from Bridgeport, community organizer. I um, have some fridges around Connecticut, community fridges, feed about 1,200 nice. people a week. We do three to five tons of food a week um, through 100% organ donation. Did you say model. three to five tons? Yeah. <laughs> oh, shucks. No, 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 Dude. no. It's not for me. It's not for me. But um, either way. That's, uh, that's 10,000 pounds, man. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, it's donation. So it's everyone. It's people like here that do it. I'm yeah, just, amen. I'm just a pretty face. Cool. But um, I'm working on policy with Haley right now, trying to build infrastructure in Connecticut. Um, if you have 15 questions, you have to talk to 15 people, like Department of Ag, Consumer Health, et cetera, oh, et cetera. Yeah. Um, currently, there's two systems in this country, New Nevada, New Jersey, that have like a Department of Food something that works with food. What other systems that you've heard about while traveling that work specifically with food? Because there are, there are a lot of systems, but they're not a lot of like one centralized place that works with everything. So. It's kind of like there's there's no foundation. Everyone's stepping on right. sandy ground. For example, if you ask me what food insecurity is in Bridgeport, I give you five answers because I've done the research with all the schools around Bridgeport, all the colleges, and there, there's no rhyme or reason behind either. There's no continuation. There's no collaboration, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. But so, what are the government level infrastructural systems that you know of or may have heard of, or some stuff that are being built that could be examples of stuff that could be built in state? Well, you know, un un unfortunately. But also, fortunately, I mean, you answered your own question. There, there aren't any. Um, you know, there, there aren't any centralized. I mean, it, to, to me, it would be, um, you know, it, when, when Barack Obama got elected, a whole bunch of people said, Michael Pollan for Secretary of Agriculture. And I said, God, no, please don't let that happen. Um, because it just, the, the, the hierarchies and and just the complexity of our governmental systems are massive, right? It, you need somebody who's like run Boeing <laughs> to run a federal agency. You have somebody who can have 85,000 employees report to them. All of the systems that are in place right now, agriculture marketing services, economic research services, food nutrition services, were all set up decades ago. The problems today are different. The problems today are at such a localized level, and the things that impact your organization, that impact the organization. Was that Allison? Was that her name who was just up here earlier? Did I get that right? Alexa. Alexa. Oh, oh, Alexa. Could you turn on the coffee machine? No, sorry. Anyway, I couldn't resist. Um, you know, um, it, it's there's the state health department. Then there's uh, the, the there are county health departments, then local health departments. The the federal sets the minimum standard. The state can actually make the standard harsher. They can't make it easier. So it, and and the county can make it harsher than the state, and the local can make it even more harsh than the county. But nobody can make it easier. You know. So so there there are a lot of people that are engaged with food and the regulations around food that you guys have to deal with that are just not centralized anywhere in New Jersey, uh, actually in Southern Arizona uh, as well. New York City 
has a lot of these areas have created food policy councils that are multi-stakeholder collaboratives of companies, agencies, nonprofits, nutritionists, academics, community organizers like yourself um, that really have skin in the game of how do we make sure every one of our neighbors has a decent meal to eat and can feed their children in a way where they're going to perform well in school, all that good stuff. Food Policy Council can actually then make recommendations and be chartered to make recommendations to a body of government, whether it's a city council, whether it's a township, whether it's, it's a county board of supervisors or state. We're town hall rule here in Connecticut. But it, it really is you and enough folks from within the communities that you serve to get together to demonstrate the will. You have to, uh, unfortunately, it's just, it's not like you're not doing enough work already, but you're going to have to do more, right? Because you have to have governance, you have to have meeting minutes, you have to, you have to become a functioning entity, and then you get a bunch of these folks who have been donating food to be on your advisory council, board of directors, whatever it might be, people who whose voices are heard around election time, et cetera, who can help you guys represent and get people to actually start passing regulations that can build structure around what you're trying to accomplish. I don't know the nuance of what it is that you guys need that would make it easier to do what you do. Um, but again, I, the, the offer is out there. I've done uh, office hours and, you know, it's, if I had a nickel for every, every person that we at Wholesome Wave have helped over the years that's trying to do something and figure it out, always very, very happy to help. Um, the bad news is it doesn't exist. The good news is that there's nothing in the way to prevent you from making it happen if you get enough stakeholders who believe in the same things that you believe. Get you guys to align on the same thing and, and create the body and go for it. Cool. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thanks. Hi. Um, Hi. Thank you. Everything that you've said, everything that you do is incredible. I have a huge question, so I'm just going to ask you to tell me, what do you think is the most important thing that we should think about now in the whole food is medicine movement? This is seeming to really be gaining a lot of momentum. Mm. You clearly have a lot of firsthand experience and mm. more. What, what, what should we be doing? What should we know? I, you know, I think um, one is... Um, all of the things that you have heard uh, over the last kind of decade, decade and a half since, maybe it's even 20 years, holy cow, um, like Food Inc. and all those things have come out, you know, um, don't buy it if you don't, if you can't pronounce the ingredient. All, all of that stuff, those are the things we can do personally, right? Um, you know, when, when I look at the food is medicine movement, and the impact of low-income, disenfranchised communities on national health care costs. They bear the brunt of it, and they bear the brunt of the suffering. They lack the economic resources to put a ripe tomato on the table. When you have $2 for dinner, here's what the meal looks like. You, you can get an eight-pack of ramen noodles at a dollar store for $1.39. You can get a can of condensed milk for like 69 cents, two bucks. That's dinner. Now, it's not that bad of a meal if you don't do the condensed milk, maybe a can of condensed soup, but if you could put broccoli in it, <laughs> you know, um, or you could slice a tomato and eat half of, each person could eat half a tomato and, and get the fiber that they need with those highly processed noodles and stuff, it's gonna metabolize completely differently. It's pretty simple. Lack of affordability for those who can't afford to make a healthier food choice. And then the public health movement needs to demystify. It's like what they did in COVID. You know, massive disconnects because they were being too sparing with the information that they were putting out or the information that they were, were putting out was conflicting and confusing. Um, somebody who's struggling with, with poverty pardon my language, can't give a rat's ass what the social determinants of health are and what it means. They don't care. All they know is that their kid only got two meals today and they skipped one so their kid could have, their kid could have two. They don't need to know um, that tomatoes have niacin and lycopene and all of these other things. They don't need that. They need to know, if I get a resource that can only be spent on fruits, vegetables, and whole grains and legumes, 
which, which ones are best for me, <laughs> what the hell do I do with them, and where can I get them? I mean, if we can answer those questions and we can provide those resources in every community in the country, then we can truly say if there are people who have the resources and they just choose not to do it, they've exercised their right of free choice not to participate in a healthy lifestyle. But if they have $2 for dinner and they can't afford broccoli, they do not have the right to choose broccoli. And the right to choose isn't, an, isn't in the First Amendment, the Second, the Third Amendment. It's in the frickin' Bill of Rights. It didn't need an amendment. And there literally are over 40 million Americans who can't exercise their right to choose something as simple as broccoli. So, you know, the affordability, the access needs to be there, and the messaging needs to be in everyday layman's terms, the terms that we speak uh, to each other when we're feeding each other and putting a decent meal on the table. It's lettuce, eat it, it's good for you, done. <laughs> right? Thank you. You're welcome. Are we done? I just have one other question. Oh, you have a question. Oh, cool. Awesome. I could go all night. A little birdie <laughs> told me that you might be starting a podcast. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Oh, wow. Um, Courtney could tell you a lot about it. Um, yeah, I, it's, uh, it's this thing, you know, she, she, she made me do it. Um, it's her idea. Uh, and it's going to be myself with a, a chef called J.J. Johnson. He has this awesome set of restaurants in Harlem called Field Trip. Well, Harlem, um, uh, New York City, and he's starting to expand. Um, really awesome young chef uh, who's setting the world on fire. And he and I um, share in common friends in the food, music, industry world. Um, and uh, we, we really believe that. You know, plenty of folks like JJ who does what he does, plenty of folks like Wholesome Wave who do what we do, um, but it's like individual organization, organizations deciding that something can't stand and then trying to do something about it. Uh, and we're, our, our whole thing is like, well, what the hell happens if everybody actually gets together, opens the kimono a little bit, and decides to collaborate? to set aside any fears of loss of IP, to set aside, um, you know, opening something up to a competitor that you would rather not, whatever it might be. It's like, how do we challenge people from music, from food, from industry that are looking at some of society's most vexing problems, not just food, um, and what can happen if everybody got together and decided to really work together in a meaningful way? Uh, so that's that's what the podcast is about. Um, JJ and I are going to be speaking, I think, with Sean Sherman is going to be one of our first guests in March. Um, you know, Jacques, um, Jacques is going to join us for a couple. Um, but what, what we want to try to do is, is show what these leaders can do to collaborate better, but also challenge listeners. Uh, and viewers to do the same in their own lives. You know, it's this whole thing of, you know, it, it's so funny when my, when I was on, I used to work every summer on my grandfather's farm until he passed when I was 17. And I didn't remember this memory until Lori and I were sleeping one night in, in the flames of a neighbor's house burning two doors down, woke us up. It was March. It was like 38 and raining. We, we, we went out to Lori's like, get blankets, get checks, get, you know, they're, they're going to be cold. So we go out and we couldn't get anywhere because they had police tape all over the thing. And the family was huddled in the middle of the yard um, with some firemen coats on. And the neighbors were all around. And we heard stuff like, I hope they have good insurance. Who do you think set the fire? Um, and I was heartbroken because when I was somewhere between nine and 11 or 12 years old, um, you know, I just remember my grandfather, my mom, and uh, my Aunt Lucille getting us up one morning saying we all got to go to the feed store. A neighbor's house had burnt down and everybody got together and it's like, we got clothes that'll fit the girl. Oh, we got clothes that'll fit the boys. They can use our truck on Tuesday and Friday to get to work. They can, you know, it's like the community, neighbors were neighbors who knew each other who knew that if anybody in the community fell down, 
that it was everybody's job to pick them up because in farm country, a tornado can tear through anybody's field. You can be the most successful farmer in the world. If you're growing sweet corn, melon, rutabaga, if you're growing vegetables, at that time there was no crop insurance for those crops. Federally subsidized, only, only feed corn, soy, cotton, wheat, and rice got federally subsidized crop insurance. So it's like anybody could end up with nothing tomorrow. Um, so I just, you know, my, my thing is active neighborliness. Um, in a community garden, you know, uh, in, in the Bronx, if you're in an affordable housing complex, if you're in 1A and someone happens to be in 1B, technically you're neighbors. But if that housing complex has a community garden and the person in 1A is one of the few that's been able to avoid the tomato blight this year, but they can't cook their way out of a paper bag and the person in 1B cooks kick-ass or makes kick-ass pickles, all of a sudden the person in 1B is the person who, who makes the kick-ass pickles. They, they want to know what you did with your tomatoes. You want to learn how, all of a sudden, you're acting like neighbors. Neighbors should mean more than the person who happens to live next door. Long, long way around saying that's what the podcast is all about. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope that everybody will look out for that podcast. And thank you so much, Michelle, for coming today and enlightening all of us. We thank you all. had a great time with My you. My pleasure. Thank you.